Hello, my name is Pastor Freddy Reynosa, and I am the senior pastor at the Stoner Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill in Stoner, Massachusetts. Our church has been serving the greater Boston area for over a hundred years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonamemorial.org, or visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you for joining us here at our weekly church service. Well, it's so wonderful to see you this morning. So many smiling faces, I believe, behind those masks, I hope. <laughs> it, uh, I wish you all a very happy Sabbath, and it is my hope that you are all uh, blessed abundantly this morning. If you're here for the first time, we're happy that you came to worship with us. Please allow us to get acquainted with you, and it is our hope that uh, you come back many, many more times. For those of uh, you that are watching through live streaming, I'd advise you not to move from your seats because blessings are coming your way. So that being said, it is my privilege this morning and a great honor to welcome you to the Sto Seventh-day Adventist uh, Stoneham Memorial Church. And if there's anything that we can do to make your visit here more pleasant, you just let us know, please. It is my sincere hope that uh, we are blessed in a powerful way as we worship together. Thank you very much, Kathy, and blessing Manana. Um, their father, Eden Manana, is going to join them. They have been asked to participate today because we have some very special information and special thrilling activity that's happening in our union. And they are from Malawi. And they are actually from the region that is near the Adventist University. It's called the Malawi Adventist University. There are about 1,500 students altogether there. About 900 study the medical sciences, midwifery, x-rays, labs, that kind of thing. And then around another 600 students study business, education, theology, and agriculture. So, as we tell you the children's story, and uh, this is the big, big project for the union because there will be nine departments that are working together. The education, early childhood, children's ministries, youth department, pathfinders, adventurers, community services, medical cadets, and the women's ministry. All nine departments are joining together to do a special mission trip. It'll be a virtual mission trip. In the past, the union and the academies and the conferences have sponsored trips for pastors, students, medical, and different things like that to other countries. Because of COVID, we did not go anywhere last year, and it doesn't look like we're getting very far this year. So it was decided to do a virtual mission trip, something we can do to help somebody else and we can help them in real true needs. So the children's story today, and I have a few pictures because I wanted to show children the schools we visited. We had the privilege of being there one week and we visited Adventist schools and public schools. The ones that I'm gonna show you now are the public schools. So we were up at about five in the morning and we started traveling out of the city and from the Highway 1, which is a two-lane paved road, you go into the other kinds of roads that are mostly dirt. This is early in the morning and you can see a lady is already hoeing. She's preparing her ground for planting and on that bicycle is a whole family and the children are already walking to towards school. Um, the next picture shows you how they start very early in the morning. At five, they're already out there with their hoes. And all of these are rows for planting. The reason we were there is because ADRA invited us. There had been a drought in this region and there was just no food. When we were there, we didn't see, as you can see, there's hardly anything, um, there's, hardly any shrubs or anything like that. And usually this area would be producing the food that goes into the city. So 
the Adra had come and every morning at 7.30 in the morning, they would have porridge for the children. Everybody brought their own plate, their own cup, and they would be given some porridge, which has oatmeal and soy and every nutrient a child would need. So the next picture shows when we arrived at the school. The school has 1,500 students, and as you can see, it's all very, very clean. Um, they had been there preparing for the visitors that were coming, and the next slide will show you how they cleaned it. Oops. No, there. That is how they swept that whole big area. The children had the little brooms that they had made. They're about this long and they swept it all clean, and they do that each day at the beginning of the day. The next picture will show you a classroom. This is the newest classroom. And as you see, all the children sit on the floor. There are no chairs, there are no books, there are no bookcases, and um, the teacher is doing a fantastic job. Um, the group I was in were directors of education whose job it is to evaluate teachers. And we were asked to just, because they wanted, the Department of Education wanted to find out from us exactly what they could do to improve the program. And so the next picture will show you um, another classroom. Now, it's sideways, but if you look at that bulletin board thing, he has a piece of car, uh, paper up there taped. That is the lesson he's teaching. You see how he's holding up the book? Okay. We saw a class of 123 first graders, 123 first graders in one class with one teacher. It's totally amazing that one teacher can teach 123 six-year-olds and they're all paying attention and they're all on task. I sat there and I just, just an amazement and I said, I want to shake that man's hand. He really was doing a fantastic job. There was one thing, though, that I did was to count how many books there were. Amongst all the children in first grade, there were eight books. And they're trying to learn to read. How do you learn to read? He was holding the book up in front, and he was writing letters on a little chalkboard. If you want to, at some point, I can show you the whole story. But right now, I'm going to try to make it quick. So look at that bulletin. Thing that's up there, I'm going to show you what happens to that. That's the lesson for the day. Now, first through seventh grade sit on the floor. The principal explained to us at the meeting that we had the conclusion of the day that eighth graders have desks. And the reason is that eighth graders need to learn how to sit at a desk and take tests because they're getting ready for the high school entrance exam. So these are the eighth grade. Now, of 100 children that start first grade, 15 finish eighth grade. Most of them drop out between fourth and fifth. Many of the girls are married at 13. We went to one school where they told us very proudly that their school board and the village elders had voted that if the girls, because some girls had cried and cried and begged and begged, they wanted to go to school, they didn't want to get married and their fathers agreed if their husbands agreed, and so some marriages were annulled, and some marriages the husband allowed them to go back to school. So I, I felt very honored to, to meet these young girls that had fought so hard to go to school. Now, these young women are fortunate because they have not been married and they're not having to stay home. In this class, this is how many are left that are now in eighth grade. That go to high school of this class, maybe three or four will have the privilege of going to high school. So these, when we saw the need, we said, oh, we can do something. What can we do? So please continue. This is what ADRA did. They provided seed. And they planted, and if you show the next picture, um, you will see that what they did was they built a well. They, they dug a well, and this kids after school would come and water that garden. And so that was part of their agriculture class at the high school. 
Now, there's something that touched my heart when we asked the teachers, what is something that would help you be a better teacher? We had a number of teachers that told us, we would like to teach the Bible class better. And then we realized that in their government's schedule, these children all have two hours of Bible class a week. And they were asking for materials, songs, things they could use in the classroom to make it more interesting and more alive. This is including in the Mo Muslim areas where they teach the parts of the scripture that match and mesh with the Quran. The villages uh, agreed to that. So these children are all participating in the improvement of their school. If you turn to see the next slide, you will see the, the, the area. Oh, this is the kids after school helping the teachers. Do you remember that white poster on the wall? He takes it down and one of the children volunteers and that's white shoe polish. They cover the lettering from one day so the teacher can make the poster for the next day. So every day they're inventing it again. They're re-whiting it out and writing it again. We were really impressed with how hard they worked at getting work done. The next picture is a picture that I really treasure. Um, that's the garden. They did real well at that school. There were some schools that garden didn't do well. Now this picture is special because this is one of the older classrooms. And this young man, uh, we were all out in the courtyard. Everybody, the group from us, the group from the college, and this young man came up to me. And he is in, uh, I think it's fourth, fifth grade, fifth grade. And they have had in English classes in the fourth grade. So he came up to me and he said, please come. And I, I was surprised because he had walked amongst all the people and chosen me and looked at me directly in the eye. He said, please come. And I said, okay, where are we going? Classroom. So he walked me over there and he stood very proudly because he had been able to go to school. Most of the children, by the time they're his size, have to be working in the field. And that's because the whole family has to work in the field to get their crops. So he was proud to be in school. And if you get a chance to meet him or see his eyes, he is a bright kid. And it just made me so happy that he was proud of what he was learning and he was trying to connect with me. The next picture shows what the fields look like, and I was touched with how hard they work to get something done and how kind everyone was. And Malawi is called the warm heart of Africa, and it really is. Now we have in this country, 10% of the population is Adventist. However, they need more help. They need more materials. I've been in contact and working with the president of the university and the director of education and youth and the union. If you try to call me, sometimes I'm sleeping because I talk with them like two or three in the morning. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to keep the time schedules. But God is blessing and they're really excited. Now what the union is doing, there's gonna be two containers. One is gonna leave out of Connecticut, one out of Lancaster. These are 40-foot containers. They will each hold approximately 2,000 boxes. We will be boxing books out of the library that uh, is there on campus. We will send those books to Malawi Adventist University. We have two lists that I have um, sent to the church, and hopefully you'll get it in the next church bulletin. It says all the different things that they have requested for. One of them is medical. Uh, journals, uh, books, of nursing, things like that. I have the whole list. One is wedding dresses, because a lot of young women would like to be dressed in a white wedding dress, but they can't afford one. So there's just a list of specific things people are wanting. My husband wishes he was here to share that with you, but he's preaching at another church. It is 
his baby and his department, and uh, of course I'm collaborating because my heart is in it. So our special song today is going to be uh, one of our songs from a hymn, but we are going to sing in our, our language Mal uh, from Malawi. Um, we call that language Chichewa. So we're going to sing it, but in uh, hymnal is uh, 341, number 341. And happy Sabbath. I'd like to welcome everybody, including our brothers and sisters joining us online. We hope that one day we'll be back together. We look forward for that day, but most of all for the day when we will understand this song like it will be spoken in our language in, uh, in, in heaven. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who took part in the program, beginning with Dennis, who uh, raised uh, the, the important information in the bulletins, uh, our brother who stepped in to, to provide heavenly music, uh, Ted and Sharon who, who did what I should have done and preached, uh, so, so it's very much appreciated, uh, uh, Susan and, and, and the, the Malawi uh, mission, which uh, 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 with God's blessing should be a great success. And uh, I'd like to, to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for unifying us, bring us together to the understanding of your word and prepare us for your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. For today, I, I wanted us to try to find a meaning 
and to understand one of the most puzzling things from the Bible history. We are all familiar with the story of Jonah, with the book of Jonah since childhood. What could be more captivating for, for kids than, than to hear about uh, somebody running away from God, getting on a ship, uh, the ship almost sinking, being thrown overboard, swallowed by a fish, uh, being uh, regurgitated, so to speak, alive, then going to a great city and preaching to that city and then having an argument with God. All seems like a, like a great story. And we may wonder, what's the relevance of this for, for the contemporary uh, 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 person? What do we have to learn from this? Uh, who, who, in, who in the world believes now that it's possible to be swallowed by a fish, live three days, and then uh, uh, being alive? Uh, and I think that studying the book of Jonah um, will, will, will give us a lot of blessing and a better understanding of what God's hand can, can accomplish and uh, uh, how relevant actually this is for us as maybe the last generation of, of, the, of the history of this earth. So in doing so, I, what, what I wanted us to do is to try to see the world through the eyes of Jonah. We, we now benef benefit from the hindsight. We know history, we know what happened, but that was history uh, uh, revealing itself during his time. And uh, I spent this week trying to familiarize myself with uh, uh, old Israel, Assyrian Empire, and uh, customs of life during that time. And uh, uh, it was an amazing journey that I would like to, to share with you. So remember, those things that we know that have taken place now are just beginning to happen when Jonah is is uh, uh, fulfilling or trying to not fulfill at the beginning his mission. We first heard about Jonah in, in the Bible in, in the second Kings, in the chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, please open with me in second Kings chapter 14. And there, verse 25. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the Sea of the Plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hefer. So that, that places Jonah as a historical character. He's not fiction. There's a, there was a real person by the name Jonah who was a prophet and who is mentioned in, in the Bible with a, 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 a successful, so to speak, a prophecy coming to, to, uh, to, to happen, coming to be. And that happens to be something positive. The, the Israelites are getting access to the sea and that allows them to, to, in, to engage in trade and uh, uh, the, to... to uh, 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 maintain their level of, of living. Uh, the rabbinical tradition has an interesting hypothesis regarding Jonah. They, uh, uh, they think that he, he could have been the son of the widow of Zarepta, who was raised from dead uh, by, by the prophet uh, Elisha during, during his, uh, his visit to Zarepta. And while this cannot be confirmed, and it's probably not true, it is, an interesting, it is an interesting hypothesis regarding who the prophet was. Nevertheless, uh, what makes one a prophet? We, we may wonder, what is the job description of a prophet? Well, uh, at, least, at least during, during that time, the prophet was a person who had access uh, through direct communication to the divine revelation and was appointed as, a, as an advisor to the king of Israel. And uh, uh, his mission was to provide advice from God 
to, to provide prophecies that were predictions of the future, which were based on contingencies and uh, uh, function uh, in, in this role of an advisor from, from God, directly from God. It's interesting that sometimes prophets are, are being described as vessels through which God speaks. And uh, uh, in th th there are circumstances in the human pathology where people have the feeling that an external agency takes over and speaks through them. Uh, and uh, their words are not their, the words that they want to say, but somebody else is taking control. I'm not suggesting that that's what happened to Jonah, but that may shed, who knows, some light about how God uses people and speaks through them. But th this, is, this might be the, the, uh, the subject and the topic of another of another uh, discussion. However, uh, let's go to the book of Jonah and uh, read from there in, uh, in uh, chapter one. We don't know how old Jonah was. We don't know what was uh, uh, he uh, involved with at the time. However, uh, as uh, usually, the, the word of the Lord, uh, which, which is not a strange phenomenon to him, uh, is uh, coming and advising him. In chapter 1, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh that great city and cry against it for their wickedness is come up before me. And uh, with, with this, I would like to show you um, a map to uh, give us some idea as to what happened after Jonah heard the divine prompting. As this gets on the screen, we, we, we just have to, to keep in mind that uh, um, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, which happens to be about 550 miles towards the east, northeast of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, what he chose to do instead, uh, and this is maybe the main question that we will have to answer today. What determined Jonah to run, and what can we learn from, from this? Instead of uh, taking a, a, a trip fi for 500 miles, Jonah goes down to Joppa, and uh, from there he's preparing to, to, to board a ship, boards a ship bound to Tarshish, which in the Hebrew culture was thought to be the most western end of the world. There was nothing that they knew to, to be farther away than, uh, than Tarshish uh, from, uh, uh, from Nineveh. Um, and please remember the word down. That we, we will see that down happens a few times uh, in the first part of Jonah's experience. So he goes to Joppa, which is the next slide. Joppa is an interesting city because it's one of the very few ports uh, that Israel had access to during that time. It's mentioned in the Bible a few times. Uh, one of the uh, very first mentions is when cedars, uh, which were used to build Sol Solomon's temple, were brought through this port in, uh, in, in Joppa or Jaffa, as, as it's called nowadays. It hasn't changed too much. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the line, the, the, the ship line, so to speak, from here to, to Tarsus was uh, served by some uh, huge 
uh, ships, which were all, so awe-inspiring that the, inspiring that they are mentioned a few times in the Bible. The ships of Tarshish uh, are mentioned by by the psalmist as uh, uh, who who re looks at them with awe. They, they were probably big, and uh, presumably uh, uh, able to resist all kind of storms at sea. And uh, they were used uh, to, to bring a lot of uh, goods from, from Tarshish and uh, in the uh, uh, commercial activities and the links between Israel and uh, the end of the world, so, so to speak. So he, uh, he, got, he comes to, to Joppa. Oh, and by the way, Joppa is also mentioned in the New Testament as the, the, the place where Peter received the vision uh, from the Lord where he should not regard as unclean what God has cleaned. That was the place. Maybe on the roof of one of those houses uh, is the, the place where, where uh, Peter had received that vision. This is also what Jonah might have seen as he was uh, trying to get on, on the ship from Tarshish and, and run away from the Lord. I was mentioning the, the, the word down because Jonah's uh, life for the next few weeks from here follows a downward spiral. He goes from, first from Jerusalem down to Joppa. From Joppa, he, he, uh, he pays for the full fare up front, which was not the custom during their times. The, the fare was paid upon arriving and not in advance. And he also tells the crew that he's actually on that ship in order to escape and run away from the face of the Lord, which obviously they didn't care too much since they were uh, uh, probably a group of idolatrous people from all over the area, and they did not care much about the God of, of the Jewish people any more than, than their own gods. So he gets on the ship, and in the ship, on that ship, he gets further down in a place where he, he falls asleep. So how many times he, he went down from here? About three times. It doesn't, it doesn't stop here, though. Uh, they, they, start, they, they start their journey, and apparently the, the storm that, uh, that, that started, and which is similar with a storm that, in a way, Jesus experienced on the Lake of Galilee, because the, the words describing it are the same. The storm seemed possibly to have affected only that ship. So it, it, it was clear that, number one, it was a supernatural type of storm, of, of event happening, which drew the attention of the crew that, so that they started actually bringing sacrifices to their gods. And, and those are not people that, those seamen are not people that could be scared easily into submission by, 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 uh, by a storm. They must have seen and, and been through many, many storms before. But this is something totally that they, they recognize as being supernatural and potentially destructive. So they start sacrificing to their Lord. It doesn't work. They start throwing their artifacts and their God, their, their God statues overboard. The, the, the sea, only to see that the sea is even more agitated. And then the captain recalls the fact that there, there's somebody else on this ship who is sleeping. And he goes to Jonah and is asking, sleeper, awake, and pray to your God. Let's have this council of gods. Let's pray and see maybe, maybe they will spare our lives. Jonah uh, uh, gets up and totally unexpectedly calm and tells them, yes, this is happening because of me. What's the big deal? Throw me overboard and it will stop. And at first sight, nobody in the book of Jonah is doing what they are supposed to do. And this continues up until the, end of, uh, until the very end of the book. He, he's calm. He, uh, he, he's trying to sacrifice his life, knowing that this will uh, uh, spare the, the, the crew's life and is asking them calmly to, to throw me overboard. Uh, the rabbinical tradition uh, describes three stages of Jonah's being thrown overboard. First, they, they uh, lowered him enough 
so that his feet could touch the water. And, and, and they think that the, the storm kind of abated. They, they tried to, to reel him back in and the storm restarted. Then the second time they, they, they let him sink a little, a little lower, they, they pulled him back, same thing. Until the third time uh, he was thrown overboard. Whatever the, the truth it was, the Bible says they, they took him, they threw him overboard and, and the storm stopped. And uh, uh, I think it's a lesson for us to remark that uh, on that ship, uh, the, the messenger was, of God was less interested in asking for God's forgiveness and assistance than a crew of so-called idolatrous people who were praying. And uh, not only that, after seeing the events, they started worshiping God. They, they, they were converted just by seeing that, that, that type of experience while Jonah is left this time to, to go down again. And this time he's going down where? To the bottom of the sea. Could it be any lower than that? Could, could somebody sink any lower than this? Well, here comes the interesting part. Apparently, while he was sinking, and sea weeds were, 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 were surrounding him, as he himself describes. God sends a fish, a huge fish. Uh, a big fish is described in, 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 the Hebraic, uh, in, in the Hebrew manuscript, who was prepared by God. That's another word that comes very often at the very essential moments in the book of Jonah, prepare, God prepared. So God this time prepared a fish, a huge fish, to swallow Jonah. And uh, that happens with him being unharmed and uh, ends up spending three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. I was talking about contemporary view of, of, of Jonah. And um, Jonah, as, as we know, is the only of the prophets that is mentioned specifically by Jesus. And uh, uh, Jesus talks about the sign of Jonah. We'll, 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 uh, we'll get to that. But it is believed that when Jesus was mentioning Jonah, his audience would have known what kind of fish was that. So it was not a monster. It was not a fish that was just created for that uh, uh, occasion, although nothing of, of that would have been impossible to God. But it was one of the existing type of, of sea animals uh, uh, that, that was around there and uh, uh, swallowed Jonah. This is an interesting painting by Peter Bruegel, the elder. Uh, and that's, that's the way he saw uh, the prophet actually coming out of the mouth of the, of the fish. Now, the, the next question is, before we get back into trying to find out Jonah's reasons. The next question is, why did God want Jonah to go to Nineveh? And what was the reason for the city to be destroyed? According to, uh, uh, to what uh, archeology span and, and history tells us, Nineveh was probably the, the biggest uh, uh, city of that, of that time. Uh, it has this, um, in the book of Jonah, is described as uh, uh, a three-day walk. In order to get from one end to the other, one would have to walk three days. And uh, the, the longer side probably had around three miles. And then uh, uh, the shorter sides between one, one and one and a half miles. And this is the, what was discovered by, by digging and looking at the circumference of the walls. The walls of the city were, were thought, were believed to, to be 100 feet high and uh, 50, uh, um, 25 to 30 feet wide. And now imagine that by, even by our standards, they, they, they would allow the, the, uh, um, two carriages 
to pass in, in the same time. And um, they were imposing to see from a distance. Uh, it is also believed that that was the inner city and that the whole Nineveh area uh, was inhabited possibly by over a million people. Uh, the population that, that uh, Jonah uh, gives in his book is 120,000. God is telling him that there are 120,000 people and cattle who do not know their right from their left. However, it is not known whether that was the number of people inside the walls uh, or uh, th there are some commentators who think that that was the number of children. At any rate, this was the, the, the biggest, the city of the uh, uh, ancient times, and it happens to be the, one of the worst enemies of, of Israel. What, are, what is the wickedness of, uh, of Assyrians? I would prefer not to share with you, just to mention the fact that it was cruelty uh, at the max, at an unimaginable, on an unimaginable scale. So uh, God uh, made it clear that because of this, they will be destroyed. Also, the name of the city comes probably from uh, Nina. Nina is uh, uh, one of the gods in the Assyrian religion whose name is written in cuneiform as an enclosure and inside there is water and a fish. Does that ring a bell with, with, uh, with Jonah's story? What, what God, why in fact God chose a fish as the vehicle for, 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 for the uh, unrepentant prophet and what significance that, uh, that have and how uh, his message was facilitated by a group of people in the, uh, living in this city knowing that the name of the city has to do with fish and that one of their main deities, one of their main gods was, uh, was the god, the fish god. Um, which was uh, described in the Bible under the name Dag Dagon. The Dagon, Dag means in uh, Hebraic fish. Dagon was half uh, human, half fish, and was one of the gods that people in uh, Nineveh was, uh, that they were worshiping. So all of a sudden, is not this stranger who comes from a foreign land, but is almost like a prophet to them. It comes, they hear the story of somebody coming out of the mouth of a fish. And this is the name of their, their city. And this is some, some of the God, that, uh, one of the gods that they are worshiping. So all of a sudden, his, uh, uh, his uh, um, testimony starts uh, on a different note. So this is what Jonah must have entered through. Uh, when, when he came into the city. Those imposing uh, gates, which were left in ruins for, uh, by the way, until a few years ago, when ISIS destroyed them, maybe fulfilling the last part of the biblical prophecy that nothing would be left standing in, uh, in, in that area. Uh, the city had 18 gates like, like, like this. And, uh, one day, as Rembrandt imagined, the prophet Jonah arrived and wa uh, was resting, uh, feeling sad and overwhelmed under the walls of the city. Because what he saw while entering was, was unbelievable. Those were some, some of the palaces of Nineveh. Uh, they were built upon platforms, upon brick platforms, 50 feet high. And uh, they, they were, it is not known how, how many stories they had or how tall they were. This is an artist rendition of, uh, of the majesty of Nineveh. This was the city. Uh, and uh, this is what Jonah thought he was up against. Without knowing that God had prepared even his through his own worst experience, being swallowed by a fish, 
had prepared the hearts of those people in order to receive the message. Jonah is also the only prophet, the only uh, prophet from the history of Israel that is commissioned by God to go to another country. All, all the Israel prophets have been more or less involved with, uh, with the kingdom of Israel. Jonah has the commission to actually go to, to a foreign country, not to uh, uh, any foreign country, but to their worst enemy. And uh, here is the, the, probably the, one of the first hints as to why he refused to go, why he thought that he shouldn't go. Those were their worst enemies. They, they constantly uh, came, sieged their, their cities, they, they uh, uh, waged war with them, uh, and uh, uh, they, they killed their, their young people in an atrocious way. So he enters the city, goes about one day's distance, and says a few words. Very, very interesting sermon. The Bible is very concise. It does not render the whole sermon. And maybe that, that's what it was. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The word overthrown is the same used in the Bible to describe the fate of so uh, Sodom and Gomorrah the same uh, uh, word overthrown. And according to this, to what happened, Jonah might have been the most successful preacher in the history. He only said five words, followed by what? By a mass conviction uh, and acceptance of truth and by a whole empire changing their course for about 80 years. So we shall see that actually his, his message was not totally unsuccessful, but not the way that Jonah imagined it to be. And now let's try to see his own reasons. Number one, God is telling him, go to your worst enemy and tell them that they will be destroyed. Nothing wrong with that, great. Sign me up, God. I'll, 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 I'll go. They, they are our worst enemy. I'll, I'll be a national hero. Well, Jonah also knows from his own experience that God is good and that if people turn away from their evil ways, he's not, he's not bringing punishment upon them. And he knows that. And he, he probably argues with God, God, why do you want me to go and save those people? Because you are a good God. They will turn away. And incidentally, uh, the moment in history that when God wanted Jonah to go was very, uh, very appropriate for the Assyrians to hear this, uh, the, the, the message. They were engaged in a civil war. Uh, uh, the, the empire was not doing very well uh, politically, and um, people might have been more prepared to hear the message than, than they would have been otherwise. So th there is some urgency to his mission, and that's why uh, he, he's being turned around from his way and uh, sent directly uh, to, to deliver. So people of Nineveh hear the story. There is a grassroots movement that goes up to the royal palace. The king uh, gets word of this. They, they all repent. And uh, the, 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 all the description is in the book. They all repent, and God decides not to bring destruction for that time, because nothing that God says fails to happen. But during this moment and their destruction, there were about 80 years which has allowed Israel to progress and gave them more time. Unfortunately, they chose to do the opposite and continue uh, uh, in their evil ways. And then uh, 50 years later, in uh, around 730 before Christ, Assyrians came and uh, uh, during their military expedition, they conquered the northern kingdom 
and later on Jerusalem. Uh, what, what could be worse for, for a prophet to go with a, uh, with a uh, um, mission and uh, with a message to those people to see that they follow it, they are being forgiven by God, and then that's what kept Jonah from doing his mission. They came back and they destroyed his people. So how, what would be the equivalent of that today in our life? Think, think, a, think a bit. Uh, is uh, uh, the fact that God allows something uh, for somebody that we think is our enemy or that, that wishes us evil. God allows that. Uh, God gives them, God loves them, and then they uh, respond to God's message, uh, slide back again, and come down, come back to haunt us. It's uh, uh, most of the time we hear the fact that Jonah did not want to go because he knew that God will forgive the Ninevites. Well, it, it's beyond that. He knew that they will forgive, that God will forgive them. And after being forgiven, they will come back and kill his people. It takes it to a, to a whole different level. So here's the, 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 the question and, and trying to answer it. Why, why did actually Jonah run? Uh, as a prophet, uh, he would have known that uh, running away from the face of God is impossible. Even, even if going to the end of the world, it will not be possible. Remember the same idea uh, uh, Adam and Eve had, and they, they tried to hid from, from God. They didn't run away this time. They, they hid behind trees, hoping like, like the little child that they will not be discovered and chastised. So, so, so with Jonah. But he knows it's not this. He's not running away from the face of the God. He's uh, probably resigning his uh, prophet prophetic office and uh, decides to go. Uh, there, there was a belief in Israel that the Shekinah or the, the face and the, the God's glory was manifested within the confines of the Israel land. So by him putting a huge distance between himself and the Israel land, that would have been enough. In, in a way to, to, to go outside the influence of God's grace and, and uh, power. So he, he knows exactly. He's not running away from the face of God. He, he's just trying to put some distance between him and God in such a way that he will not bring actually destruction through his actions upon his country and upon his brothers. And maybe... Uh, 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 most importantly, we have uh, Jonah's words that are giving us the clue regarding his run. In, in Jonah chapter 2, Jonah has, the book has four chapters. One, three, and four are, are, are fascinating details of his journey and of his experience. The, sec the second chapter is actually Jonah speaking to us. It's almost like a psalm. And uh, uh, the, the prophet is uh, describing his experience uh, and uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, feelings and his hopes and his fears while he was in the fish's belly. I imagine that for a place where you feel inspired to write a psalm. Um, I, I, I can hardly think of a, of a, more, of a more appropriate place. Uh, in, 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 along the history, people have tried to improve Jonah's uh, journey in the fish by describing the fish as some sort of creature where inside the belly, the, uh, first the entrance was as large as the gate of the temple, and inside it was lit, and that there was some diamond that the fish had instead of the eyes through which Jonah could actually see as being on a submarine and, and, and follow his journey. 
Well, it's not that. I don't know how it was. I can't imagine. But he was not unconscious either. Uh, God will, will explain that miracle. So while God uses the agency of nature and, and this fish uh, who, whom he, he had prepared, what follows from there, including Jonah's being kept alive, is nothing short of a miracle. And, and that's, that's where he was when he writes those words. But if we look at verses, verse 7, that's where we get the answer. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So he gets to the ultimate understanding that salvation is of the Lord and not mine. I'm not supposed to renounce my duty, go uh, try to run away and not perform what I was asked to just in order to save my people. God, salvation is of the Lord. And uh, when he says, they that observe lying vanities, he's talking about the Assyrians. Those are idolatrous people. They observe their own vanity, their lying vanities, and more than that, that takes it a step further. What do, what do they do? They forsake their own mercy. So he knew, this is a nutshell, Jonah's experience. Going to the Assyrians with the most successful message, being received, and then unfortunately, forsaken, forgotten, and then inflicting destruction and death upon his own people. But that was not, not none of his businesses. The, the, uh, he, he makes it clear through inspiration, salvation is of the Lord. So summing up, uh, where is this all taking us? Uh, and the answer is simple. God loves us, and God loves our enemies. And sometimes, thinking that we have the truth makes us sink lower than what people that we think don't have the truth can ever do. And that Yes, salvation is of the Lord, and the Lord has designed uh, a plan for everybody, including for people who mean evil and for people who uh, are, are going against his, his will. Do not be surprised, I, 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 and I'm, I'm speaking for myself, that if we ever get to heaven, we will see people there whom we, we thought were the worst of the worst. And that, that was according to our own judgment. But uh, the, the book of Jonah is a testimony to the fact that there is nothing beyond God's grace. And that receiving God through a power that is not even our own is the key to salvation. And I think that's what, what Jonah's run means, and uh, uh, that, that's one of the things that we can learn from it. Amen. And now, dear Lord, please fill us with your love and help us receive it and share with everybody. In Jesus' will, amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. Again, that is 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person here at our church on Saturdays for our 1045 AM worship service, 
or for Monday night prayer time at 7 p.m. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.